You are now experiencing the, 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 the Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Digital Life. You know, the issues in Ferguson, Baltimore, Cleveland, and cities across the country have shed a light on the prison industrial complex in the United States. In fact, we have over 2.4 million people in U.S. prisons, most of which is filled with black and brown bodies. On today's show, I talk to Maya Shenwar, author of Lockdown and Locked Out, where she talks about the ever-growing prison system and the cost of destroying urban communities for profit. However, on this podcast, I talk to Maya about her blog post, Your Home is Your Prison, where she discusses how technology, algorithms, and data are playing a big role in targeting people of color and how house arrest is not as easy or free as you may think. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Maya Shenwar. Okay, we're talking to Maya Shenwar, author of Lockdown and Locked Out. How are you today? I am doing well. How about you, Kevin? I am fine. So usually I start things with a, with a funny antidote, but today is a very serious discussion, so I won't be funny, so I apologize. <laughs> because I'm usually <laughs> kind of funny, but this is a very serious subject, so I, I'm going to put my serious hat on today. Um, before we begin talking about your book, there's two things I want to talk to you about. Um, first, let's go back a few weeks to the Oscars when John Legend talked about uh, the prison industrial complex. And it was fascinating mm-hmm. to me because afterwards, mostly people were talking about Patricia Arquette and equal pay, and right. the media just totally skipped over John. Because I figured, okay, well, John's going to take some heat from this, but there was nothing. Like, this, there was no media, no attention, no anything. How did you feel when he first said that, and how did you feel that the media didn't, didn't even try to talk about the prison industrial complex? Yeah, well, I was really, really heartened by that because there's been, I think, lately, especially with a lot of the protests around police violence and the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been a tendency for people to kind of like raise this issue a little bit in public forums, but never to the point that they're actually calling it out, you know, Um, and he really, I think, did that in a very powerful way. And, you know, I obviously couldn't do it for long, but it was brief, but it was powerful. And I think the media ignoring it, I mean, look, Obama mentioned the prison system in his State of the Union or just mentioned mass incarceration. That was the first time that had happened. Um, and and no one really made a big deal out of that either, and it was just kind of glossed over. I think one of the reasons is, you know, the, the Patricia Arquette comment and all the controversy around that was something that people could glom onto as drama, but prison in its actual form, mass incarceration, is just – like you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, sad. You know, it's sad. There's no way to lighten it. Debating it, you have to get into facts and you have to get into hard truths. And that's just not something that, especially the popular media, really likes to cover. And the second thing I want to ask you about, um, so when Selma happened, because Obama went down to Selma and, and the great thing, you know, John Lewis was there, it's the 50th anniversary, and I was following it on, on Twitter with, with Summer 50. And then while I was following it, all of a sudden I saw a hashtag for Beyond the Bars, which I didn't know anything about. And I started, mm-hmm. yeah, I started reading those, what was coming, what was coming out of that conference. So basically, Beyond the Bars is a conference which talks about prisons and a prison industrial complex. And Marissa Alexander was there who wrote uh, the new Jim Crow. And it was a, just a fascinating the, the information and the stats. And the information that was coming out of that conference was so powerful. But, again, <laughs> no one covered uh, that conference. So I'm right. not sure, were you there or, or, or did you, have you ever been there? Or? Oh, yes. I, I went this year. I had the pleasure of going. And it was an amazing conference. And, basically, it was just bringing together all kinds of people who believe that we need to do something very, very structurally different in terms of, how we deal with problems that the prison system is currently dealing with, and certainly tackling the problem of mass incarceration. And yeah, and Michelle Alexander did the keynote. She's very famous, but there there really wasn't media coverage of it. Um, and I think that 
it was interesting because throughout the conference, there was kind of this assumption that, you know, well, we're all on the same page. And sometimes when I'm in this kind of, you know, universe of people who care about the prison industrial complex, I forget that, right, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily, they're not necessarily all on the same page and not everyone is thinking about this kind of transformation all the time. They'd rather ignore it. Yeah, it's pretty sad. So yeah. Yeah, you wrote the book Locked Down, Locked Out, but, the, but the, the thing that I really wanted to talk to you about, you wrote a blog post after that, which I'm not sure if it was in the book or not, but uh, it was a post that you wrote called Your Home is Your Prison. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. which dealt with a lot of the tech involved and the data involved when it comes to <laughs> cops and prisons and it was just it was just fascinating. So, um and the person that you talked about in the very beginning um was Marissa Alexander and her uh and her uh, house arrest. So for people who don't know who Marissa Alexander is, could you um uh, explain who she is? Yeah. So Marissa Alexander is a mother of three and a domestic violence survivor who was actually arrested, incarcerated, and threatened with 60 years in prison for defending herself against her abusive husband by firing a warning shot. And it was, she didn't harm anyone. And this case actually, over the past few years, particularly over the past, I guess, year and a half, has gained some publicity, although certainly not enough, and brought up all kinds of issues, in particular how domestic violence survivors, and in particular black domestic violence survivors, are criminalized when sometimes when they report incidents of domestic violence or just when the police get involved in an incident, they so often target women who are being abused. And um, and threatened sometimes with killing, with death, and are are seriously defending their lives. So this was a situation with Marissa Alexander, and she was faced with this potential 60-year prison sentence, and it it started playing out as as people learned more about her story. Like, okay, well, the main thing we have to do is defeat this gargantuan sentence, this sentence that just seemed so out of proportion with everything, even if you thought what she did was wrong. And what ended up happening was she accepted a plea deal at the last minute, right before her trial. And the plea deal gave her time served. So she had served already quite a bit of time in the county jail. And so the plea deal said, okay, you know, you get credit for time served. It was over a 1,000 days that she had spent. And in addition to that, you get two years of house arrest. And so she had to go back to jail. She had to serve, I think it was 65 days. And when she came out, she was on house arrest, and she's on house arrest right now. And what I noticed in the coverage of this story after she accepted the plea deal was that people were celebrating and saying, Marissa is free, Marissa is free. And I was, of course, very happy that she was not facing all of those years in prison, but no one was paying attention to the house arrest and the fact that she would be imprisoned in her home over the next two years. And so that's how I started out that piece, just kind of confronting this issue of people thinking that freedom means not being in prison, but really there are all these other ways that we're imprisoning people in this country. Yeah, and, and when, um, usually when people hear house arrest, they figure, okay, they'll just wear uh, an- uh, ankle monitor, electronic right. monitor in their home. And I had no idea that the person who's released has to pay for that monitor. And yeah. you, you know about other things, how like if the monitor goes off, there's, the effect, not maybe not Marissa, but for the effect on kids where the kids, my kids, like, oh, my God, my dad or my mom have to go back to jail because of the act. I mean, the ankle monitor financially is crazy, and the fact that it caused distress amongst family members and even people losing their jobs because of our ankle monitor. Right. Yeah, it's, I think sometimes people think of the ankle monitor as kind of like, oh, well, you're just wearing a bracelet. Like, 
You don't even have to think about it. But really, it ends up ruling your life. And some of those things, I, one scholar who writes about this says, effectively, the ankle monitor confines you to your home. And you can get exceptions to leave, but they're, they're very, very restrictive, and everything needs to go through the police department. So you're either bound to the walls of your home and maybe your backyard, or you're on this, like, very, very restrictive temporary leave from your home. And it, you know, so people kind of, I guess you could say go stir crazy <laughs> just for starters. You know, it's it's maddening to, to be stuck to that such a limited environment, and especially for people who have just come out of prison and are trying to acclimate themselves to the world. Uh, definitely it interferes with people's ability to transport their children to school, to go to the grocery store, just all of these basic things. And keep in mind that, you know, if you're in prison, you get your meals. <laughs> if you're on house arrest, no one's giving you meals. So people are actually kind of struggling to acquire their basic needs. At the same time, a lot of times they don't have money to provide for their basic needs because it's so difficult to get a job. Not only do you have to go through all the procedures of clearing yourself to actually go to a job if you're on an ankle monitor, and some people are not able to do that, you also have to be able to get a job. And that's hard for anyone coming out of prison or anyone who has a criminal record. But if you have the ankle monitor, it's visible. And it marks you in this way. And so that's something that a lot of people who have the monitor say, you know, I mean, one of, one of the worst things about it is just having this physical reminder all the, all the time to yourself and to others that this is the kind of person that you've been labeled. And then also, of course, as you mentioned, in a number of states, actually, people are having to pay for their own monitoring. So it's like, it, it's such a bizarre phenomenon because, you know, people don't pay rent in prison. But they've developed these, what they're calling offender-funded, privatized practices where a private company provides the electronic monitors and the state does not expend money on the system. So instead, they're saying, oh, well, you know, we're not saving money by not confining people. We're, we're going to make money or break even by forcing them to pay for their monitors. And then actually, if they can't pay those fees, sometimes they're, they're being sent to prison for lack of payment. <laughs> so it turns into this sort of debtor's prison phenomenon, something that we thought we were past, definitely. <laughs> that seems like yeah. a historical thing, you know. It, it is. I, I saw this documentary uh, last year. I can't remember the name of it. And uh, it was about privatizing of uh, prisons. And the, yeah. the guy who owns it they said, well, we can guarantee there'll be a 75% occupancy rate. Right. And mm. I was like, this is in a hotel. Like, how do you guarantee right. this? But then you have these situations where people have to pay for ankle monitors or pay, or pay for uh, different things and they can't pay for it, then they go back to prison. So it's almost like it's a, like an incestuous relationship between the people who supply the, the ankle monitors in the prison. So I don't, I'm not sure if it's a, mm -hmm. are, are there, is there, is there a double dipping where some of these people who privatize prisons also own the companies that uh, does the ankle monitors? Yeah, there's definitely the companies that are running private prisons definitely overlap with the companies. I, I'm not sure about producing the ankle monitors, but companies that run this sort of what it's called is offender-funded probation, where people actually have to pay to be on probation and to be monitored and supervised. And it, it feeds this whole system. And this is one of the things that I think is really dangerous about some of, some of the ways people are talking about doing prison reform. It feeds a system of saving money by putting the burden on 
people who are being incarcerated or monitored as opposed to the state. And so it, everyone gets excited that the state is saving money and they say, oh, we're reducing incarceration or we're reducing prison budgets at least. But <laughs> what that's doing is keeping the expenses on just regular people and, you know, people who are being punished in some way. And often those are the people that have the least money in society. So, Yeah, speaking of that, th there's also the thing called predative policy, about sorry, mm -hmm. predative policing, mm -hmm. where now we get the algorithms and data where, where basically they're targeting areas to predict crimes. <laughs> and they're usually targeting right. urban areas. Like, you know, they're not, they're not they're in the suburbs. They'll never uh -huh. do crime in the suburbs. That never happens. Right. <laughs> but, we're target, we're, but we're predicting these crimes here. I mean, it, it just seems like all this stuff seems illegal to me, but it's, but it's legal right. in some way. Yeah. Well, and it's so bizarre because they talk about it like this neat little gadget. You know, like, oh, well, this is a new algorithm for doing policing in an effective way and we're using technology to reform the future and promote safety and all these things. But really that technology is just taking past arrest data, not even, you know, crime data or violence data or anything like that. Past arrest data and saying, oh, we arrested this many people in this area in the past and so we predict that crime will happen there in the future, and therefore we have to heighten and amplify the police presence in that area. And of course, these areas are poor communities of color. That's where there are already a lot of police, already a lot of arrests, already, in fact, police violence and police militarization. And so what it's doing is just increasing the police presence in those places and increasing the amount of surveillance, often really invasive surveillance, in those areas and if at the same time benefiting private companies because of course this software also is made by a private company that is very excited about their product. They call it PredPol. That's the the company and they actually came up with the term predictive policing and so they're they're marketing this strategy as kind of a crime fighting device and really it's a strategy for making money and for arresting and incarcerated primarily poor people of color See. <laughs> it reminds me, you know, I remember when 1984 happened, and, and my, my class mm -hmm. did in 1984, and it happened, I mean, 1984 happened, and people said, well, see, nothing really happened, and George Orwell right. was wrong. But in a lot of ways, 1984 was the beginning of 1984. Yeah, yeah, it's really strange, because I think it was actually in the year 1984, or maybe just before a report came out about electronic monitoring. It was like kind of the first beginnings, first inklings of what was going to be electronic monitoring. And people started saying, you know, they were comparing it to the book. They were saying, oh, like, this is the start of Big Brother and, you know, all of this stuff. And, and there started to be, for a little while, in the limited community of people who were raising alarm bells about criminal justice, people were saying, wait a second, what are we doing? But since then, there really has not been any kind of movement against this type of thing. And it's just, it's insidious, you know, it happens quietly. And now we're just seeing it infiltrating all these different corners. And to me, the profit element is like one of the scariest parts because you have, a, People are talking more and more about private prisons, but they're not necessarily seeing all the different parts of the prison industrial complex that are privatized and that are making money off their surveillance and different types of imprisonment, even outside of private prisons. And the policing, I think, is one really, really horrifying one because it's happening it's happening to people who are unaware 
that this is even a presence, you know, that like this sort of profit making um, amplified like secret surveillance is happening pre anything, you know, they call it predictive. It's because nothing's happening yet, you know. Right. And it's been very damaging to black and brown communities, but also what's now, uh, there's a focus now of Arab and, and Muslim individuals as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And in fact, some of this data sharing and proliferation of like different kinds of data among agencies that didn't use to communicate with each other. So like local police departments, the CIA, the FBI, like all these different agencies are now sharing data. There are these centers called fusion centers where they're saying, okay, well, in order to prevent terrorism, we're just going to share all this data, and a lot of that data is profiled. You know, it's just random people filing reports, and those reports could say, oh, I saw someone who was vaguely Arab-looking in my neighborhood. They might be dangerous. And that's a data point, you know, <laughs> that's being taken seriously in a file somewhere. And so the proliferation of this stuff, I think, especially when you start expanding it, when you start sharing it between agencies, all of these things can happen under the guise of keeping people safe or preventing terrorism. And kind of that racial element just gets totally glossed over. It is because, you know, when Eric, the whole NSA, Eric Snowden thing happened, people were all up and down. It's like, oh, how dare the government look look at my right. body? <laughs> but, they will, yeah. but they won't even care about something like this that's basically in their face on a daily basis. Right, right. Yeah, it was – I thought that was really interesting how people – flew up about that particular thing, but meanwhile, there are all these other kinds of surveillance constantly happening that are actually damaging people, sending people to prison. And one thing I guess I thought of was, and that other people have been saying, is that Edward Snowden and kind of some of the revelations that WikiLeaks came up with made people who were kind of upper middle class white educated people start worrying about their online privacy. Like someone's going to read my emails or someone's going to get all my stuff or, you know, someone's going to hack into my business as opposed to policing, which they don't see as affecting them. And those are the people obviously that have the most pull in terms of government and in terms of the, the mass media. Yeah, those are the people I call. They're the ones who love orange just, just the new black. But if you right. ask them to help, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I love orange and new black. Oh, have you seen it? But then if you ask them, yeah, but what about the real prison pop pop pop? We have the Oh well, God! <laughs> it's it's so thing. funny with orange is the new black because it's like every a lot of interviews that I've done. That's like the first question that they'll ask me. I'll be like, so what do you think of Orange is the New Black? I love it. And I'm like, uh, if you see that, I mean, I think the one good thing about it is that it's gotten a lot more people to start thinking about prison, um, and that's good. But it does make prison seem like a summer camp in certain ways, and uh, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> that is not a positive thing. And um yeah. Yeah, I was more of an Oz guy. Oz to me is a little bit more realistic than, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than that. I guess the, the the thing that's really troubling, I mean, everything we talk about has been troubling. It's when you look at the numbers. Um, there's 2.4 million people incarcerated. There's 5 million mm -hmm. people on probation. I I think I think you wrote that where basically you could take the prison population and make it it's the same, most of the same number as Jamaica, where we have that mm -hmm. many people in prison mm -hmm. in, in in America. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what can be done? Because it seems like the politicians don't care. The media don't care. I mean, what's it going to take for, for, for this to change? Because it seems like back in the 70s, there were more of a focus. Even the prisoners were, were saying, hey, we need rights. I mean, we know we're in, right. we're in prison, but we need our rights. But this seems right. like it's like out of sight, out of mind. We don't care. But people have to come out sooner or later, and people got to find jobs sooner or later. And, and you need people to work. So, you know, I'm right. not sure what can be done to change this stuff. Right. Yeah. And, 
I think that's a really good point that 95% of people who are in prison are going to come out of prison. And, you know, we, we kind of think of prison as being out of sight, out of mind, like you said, like, oh, well, just put people there if they do something wrong and forget about them. But everyone's coming out, and everyone coming out has been affected by their experience and also is suffering the damage of having a criminal record, which puts them at such a disadvantage for jobs, housing opportunities, education. I think that the, there's a couple of really hopeful things going on. Um, one is kind of on a cynical level. State budgets are really crunched right now. And so some politicians who would never think about addressing mass incarceration in the past are now actually talking about it and thinking about it and it's on all these agendas that it wasn't on before because people are worried about money and prison is so expensive it's anywhere from 30,000 to 90,000 dollars per year per prisoner and so people look at those numbers and they say oh my god like I could send my kid to college for so much less than that and per prisoner and so there's, there has been definitely a shift, and I think a lot of that has come from kind of like the money angle, just in terms of, you know, governmental politics. On the other level, though, I think that we've seen a really hopeful shift in grassroots activism where a lot of the kind of like larger movements over the past few years have kind of ignored prison or they've used prison, like the Occupy movement would say, jail the bankers. And that was the role that jail played in their politics, aside from police occasionally arresting protesters. But right now, in terms of some of the movements that are happening around police violence and racial justice, prison is really being centered along with policing. People are looking at that whole prison industrial complex and saying at the grassroots level, this is something, this is one of the major issues that we really need to pay attention to. And so those efforts obviously have always been happening. There have been movements for decarceration, for creating alternatives, different ways to address harm besides prison. There have been movements to close jails and prisons and, and harmful sentencing practices and all these kinds of things. But right now, I think at the grassroots level, we're seeing more of a national spotlight on this issue and more and more people who were once active on other issues are seeing this as something that they need to care about. So to me, that's really hopeful. Now, at the same time, I mean, <laughs> I got to say, I. A couple of years ago when this rhetoric started to shift in terms of the politics, like when the president and the Justice Department and some other people started to say, oh, prison is really expensive, like maybe we should talk about it a little more, we're incarcerating people unjustly, I thought something would change. And actually, last year, the prison population increased. And so <laughs> I think, like, we have to be conscious that like, even if there's a moment right now where we're seeing hope and we're seeing a change in the way people are talking, even politicians are talking, we, we need to be conscious that like, that doesn't mean that mass incarceration is necessarily on its way down. We have to see it through and we have to stick with this movement for the long haul because it's going to take a while it's going to take a while to bring down the prison industrial complex. Well, why did the numbers tick up? Yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting because for the, the previous four years, they had been slowly decreasing. And what we saw was that at the federal level, there was something of a decrease, but the state prison population increased and Part of that, I, I think there are a few different reasons, but I think part of it is just that not a lot of policies on the state level 
were changing. So it's like there there were some definite changes in, in laws on the federal level in terms of sentencing. There was a few years ago the crack cocaine disparity, like that was addressed to some extent, not entirely. Um, there was, there have been a few changes on mandatory minimums, but there are some states that are still obsessed with incarcerating vast numbers of people. So those high incarceration states are the ones that brought up the prison population. You know, sometimes, I mean, I live in a state actually now we have a new governor in Illinois and he likes really seems to like incarcerating people. But our previous governor was a little bit sympathetic to thinking about reducing prison populations. And I, I think that I was very influenced by that in terms of how I thought of other state governments. Like I, I viewed the changes in Illinois really positively. But when you look at especially a lot of the states in the South, there hasn't been this shift in rhetoric. There hasn't been a shift in thinking. They're still in this kind of lock, lock people up and throw away the key mindset. They're still like using, even publicly, all of the coded racial language that perpetuated during the, the law and order era in the 80s and 90s where they're doing all of these things that promote incarcerating more and more and more people. So I think that like part of the issue is that if you're really trying to address mass incarceration on a national level, you have to look at every single state. You can't forget about Georgia and Louisiana and Alabama and think, oh, well, look, you know, um, New Jersey has incarcerated fewer people this year because that's not going to shift the national tide. Yeah. In that documentary that I saw, um, it was talking about the three, three strikes rule. And it was mm-hmm. saying in, in the heartland, uh, because uh, of mess, uh, there's a lot more white prisoners, male and female, mm-hmm. because of mess. And they're and they getting tied up in this whole three strikes rule. was basically for, for, for black and brown people. But now, because of mess, because it's so stringent, they have to, they have to lock these people up because you've got three strikes. So my feeling is, I hate to say it, but more white people get locked up, <laughs> then things might change. But that seems like the only that's it seems like that's the only way things are going to change. So if so, if some politician's kid or or friend or or or, or donor somehow their kid gets yep. locked up because of this three strikes rule, then things might start changing. You know, I think that's totally right, and it's funny because I was just talking to someone about like. Well, you know, I mean, these politicians or, like, these financial executives, like, their kids are not going to be locked up for cocaine or whatever. And then we were talking about, like, well, you know, some of the bankers and some of the politicians actually have friends that are going to prison (laughs) now, you know. Um, And will that have an impact? Like, when Martha Stewart went to prison, she came out and started talking about mass incarceration. Not that much, but, you know, it's hard to go to prison and come out and not talk about it and not think it's bad, you know. So I think that's a really good point. Um, And that that shift toward uh, definitely, like, mass arrests were, were one thing, and, you know, often it it has to do with white collar crime. Like when you see upper middle class white people go to prison, usually then they're coming out and talking about mass incarceration. Um, And so, right, in a way, ironically, that could be a hopeful development. (laughs) We can only hope. (laughs) We we, we only scratch the surface. But, you know, I have to end this conversation. Yeah. Uh, Maya Shimwar, thank you for the conversation. If people want to check you out and check your book, Lockdown and Lockout, where can they go? So they can go to my website, mayashenwar.com. So it's just M-A-Y-A-S-C-H-E-N-W-A-R.com. Also, the website I run, the news website, is called Truthout. 
T-R-U-T-H-O-U-T dot org. And I would encourage everyone to go there for more information about the prison industrial complex. Yeah, and one final thing, how did you write started uh, being a pen pal? Because um, because you correspond quite a bit with prisoners, and, and, you, and you tell their stories in the book. Uh, but how did you start uh, being a pen pal? Well, what happened, it's funny because I – started out not as a pen pal, but as a journalist writing to prisoners for interviews because that was the only way that I could get an interview with them because it's so hard to communicate with people in prison. So I wrote to a couple of people on death row when I was doing a story about activism on death row in Texas. And they wrote back to me with the answers to my questions But then they kept writing to me after the story was over. And of course they kept writing to me because they had very few other ties on the outside and they had very little to do in prison and they, you know, were just reaching out for human contact. And so that was how I I first got started as a pen pal, just writing back and forth with people I had interviewed who just continued writing to me. And it definitely, I mean, being a pen pal completely shifted my perspective on the prison system and on criminalization in general. And I would really recommend to anyone who's interested in this to reach out to a pen pal in prison. Yeah, because in a lot of ways, like you said, I mean, uh, there's a lack of just real contact with people because prison, Mm -hmm. prison is so harsh. And, and, you know, and listen, we're not trying to scale over, you know, people do bad things. We understand that. Right. But at the same time, they're still people. So, I mean, when they get some type of warmth that they're not getting it from a family member, they, they look forward to those types of things. Absolutely, yeah. And it really, I mean, it can change things for people psychologically and even physically. Getting a letter from a pen pal is protection for you. It it shows that you have contacts on the outside and the authorities in prison are actually less likely to target you um, with harassment or abuse if they see you getting mail. So there are a lot of reasons that it's just a, a really important practice to get a pen pal. All right. Thanks a lot, Maya. Thank you so much, Kevin. Great to speak with you. I want to thank Maya Shenwar for being a great guest on The Digital Life. Make sure you check out her book, Locked Down and Locked Out, and go to truth-out.com. That's truth-out.com. And read her post, Your Home is Your Prison. Before I go, I have a Twitter question for you. Tweet me at Kim Lockett and tell me about other writers, bloggers, or programs that are shedding a light on the pipeline to prison. Use the hashtag Stop Prisons. That's the hashtag Stop Prisons. And tell me about a writer, blogger, or program that's shedding a light on the pipeline to prison. All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett. And I'm out. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.